Stanford University. Good evening. Welcome to the third session of the 2018 Contemplation by Design Summit. I'm Dr. Tia Rich, and it's a pleasure to be with you for this very auspicious talk. Uh, I am delighted to in introduce Jeremy Lent, who, as you know, has just written a very moving and insightful book, The Patterning Instinct. And he spoke with Paul Ehrlich, a professor here at Stanford at the local bookstore Kepler's in conversation about the rich insights of his book. And we are delighted to include him in this year's mm. summit to share some of that book and other aspects of his work. He's also the founder of a nonprofit, Leology, here in the San Francisco Bay Area, that helps people to have the mindset and the way of thinking that promotes a sustainable thriving on this planet. Without further ado, mm -hmm. I invite you to enjoy this hour. Thank Great. you. Great. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> Yeah, thank you all for, for being here this evening, and thank you, Tia, for um, inviting me to be part of this uh, amazing week. It feels an honor to be uh, part of this kickoff, kickoff day and this incredible summit. And um, so uh, I'll be here to talk about cultural mindfulness, which is kind of a new concept out there. And so you might be wondering <clears throat> what that is. And by the end of it, I hope you all have a, a much better idea. And um, Maybe to begin with, let me just ask for a show of hands of how, how many people here um, either engages in some kind of mindfulness or meditation practice of some kind or has in the past done something like that? Yeah, fair number. In fact, the, I'd say the overwhelming majority, I see. So as you know, one of the things that we learn in a mindfulness practice um, is that we tell ourselves stories that are not necessarily true, right? We tell ourselves stories about ourselves, about what other people think about us, about what's going to happen in the future. And then once we begin to recognize that those are just stories that we make up, they tend to have less power over us. And also once we get to realize that we're telling ourselves these stories, we actually get empowered to realize that we can create other stories, stories that might be more beneficial for us, and stories that might offer us different perspectives on life. So that's a key thing that arises from mindfulness. And what I'm going to be talking about today is that the same thing holds true for our culture, that in fact, our society tells us stories that we take for granted a lot of the time, but that are not necessarily true. And just like the stories we tell us, ourselves about ourselves, some of the stories that our culture tells us can be actually very damaging, both for ourselves, for our community, and for our, our whole global society, in fact. Um, and again, just like in our own personal mindfulness, by recognizing that, we can get freed to look at other, other stories, other ways of making sense of things. So, this was some, this idea of this kind of cultural um, mindfulness, or just the ways in which cultures make stories, is something that it took me a number of years to, to come to realize, really. Um, in an earlier part of my life, I'd been a successful business person. Uh, in fact, I, I started an internet company and took it public during the first wave of um, internet fever back in the in late 1990s. And things kind of fell apart for me around that time. Um, ha having taken the company public, um, my wife at the time, she passed away some years back, became seriously ill, and I left the company uh, to look after her. Um, and uh, in fact, I left the company too soon. And within a, really a couple of years, the company collapsed. And um, my 
um, late wife suffered from severe cognitive decline during this illness. So even though she was alive for a number of years, I'd really lost the person I'd been with for um, my entire uh, adult life. And I felt like the things that I'd built around my life were really collapsing around me. So I felt some sense of despair, as you can imagine, around that time. But I also realized, you know, this was an opportunity also for me to redirect my life to some direction that felt truly meaningful. But then I asked myself, well, what is that? Where does meaning actually come from? What, what is meaningful? And I was determined not to just accept the received ideas from uh, our culture about where meaning, where meaning lay. So I started to um, kind of look at uh, where did these ideas that we're told about come from, ideas about soul or um, even just ideas about God or any aspect of meaning. And I started to realize it was like peeling the onion. That each time you'd look at one sort of set of stories or understanding, you'd have to go back in time and look beyond then. Um, and in fact, the result of that, after years of this kind of study, was this book that Tia mentioned, The Patterning Instinct, uh, subtitled The Cultural History of Humanity's Search for Meaning. So one of the things we're going to uh, look at in the next hour or so is uh, actually understanding how different cultures have made sense of the universe and how that has led to the ways in which our culture um, understands things. And I'll be presenting for probably about half an hour or so. Uh, and then I'm going to invite us all to take part in a kind of a, um, just a little easy internal practice of this cultural mindfulness that I'm talking about here. And then hopefully that'll also leave plenty of time for like a Q&A and discussion with all of us about any of the um, insights you had or any, of, any topics that got raised today. So that's where, where we're going to go on this. So the name of the book, The Patterning Instinct, came from a realization I had as I did the research on this, that actually there's this instinct that humans have more than any other animal in, um, in, on the earth to pattern meaning into everything around us. It's a drive that we have. And that's what led humans to develop things like language and myth and culture. And a big theme of the book that we'll um, look at a little bit together is that the patterns of meaning each culture creates actually determines its values. And those values shape history. And what's so important is by the same token, the values that we create as a society uh, in today's world will actually shape the future. And that's what we'll be looking at. So what is this, this patterning instinct? Well, everyone has it. And we can call it an instinct because, well, e even she has it. Just an, a newborn infant. Nobody says to her, hey, you know, you, you're meant to learn our language, so like, make sure you listen carefully to what we're saying to you. She just hears all this stuff around um, and this kind of apparently random noise and connects it with things that happen to her. And before too long, that patterning instinct drives her to actually begin to structure meaning from everything. And she learns language. And along with language, as she gets a little bit older, she learns the patterns of thinking of her culture. So similarly, similarly way back when when humans first evolved as modern humans, they also looked at the world, and that instinct drove them to make some meaning out of it. So, for example, you know, they'd look up at the sky, and they'd see stars, but instantly they'd start to pattern constellations into those stars. Essentially, every culture in the world looks at that sky and has their constellations. And similarly, when they'd look at everything that was happening around them, they would pattern meaning into it. So I'm going to take you first off on a little journey of some of these historical patterns that different cultures uh, put into the, um, essentially the world around them through history, beginning um, with hunter-gatherers. Because actually, we humans spent more than 95% of our history as nomadic hunter-gatherers. And hunter-gatherers 
we're used to just basically taking from nature what nature gave them. And if there was, um, if it was a dry area or one place, they'd just go somewhere else where they knew that there were some good tubers or some good fruits or whatever. And so they, um, when they patterned meaning into things, their first way of seeing things was to see nature as a giving parent. And that had implications, because if the nature was a giving parent, then it means everything around them was family. So they got to see like the trees and the landscape and the animals and everything around them as being parts of the family that they were parts of. They saw everything as having spirits, spirits just like the spirits that they had. And similarly, they saw everything in transformation. So a spirit could go from an animal that, was, that they killed for food and maybe enter them. And everything was always in, in this place of transforming. And they also had no sense of boundaries. It was a world without boundaries, and that was the way in which they understood the universe. Now, all that changed beginning about 12,000 years ago with the emergence of agriculture. And I love to use this image of a fence as this sort of iconic image, if you will, of agriculture, because agriculture is all about separation separation of the fields you're cultivating from the, the sort of wild out there. And just as importantly, um, separation between humans. Um, so um, if you're working hard on planting seeds in a field and weeding it and, and then cultivating the crops, you want to stop other people from stealing the crops when they're, when they're all ready to be picked. And so separations begin to occur. And along with that, you get things, things that we're used to in today's world as if they're just a normal part of human experience, but they've really only been around for the last 12,000 years. Things like um, property, hierarchies, um, future planning, like planning for the future, specialization, um, ideas of wealth and inequality. And in fact, this was also the place where the patriarchy began in this, in this um, world of hierarchies and separation. And those, that new way of living influenced the ways in which early agrarian civilizations patterned meaning into their world. So now, rather than nature as a giving parent, they saw nature as being really the, this hierarchy of the gods. And they had priests and idols to mediate their relationship with the gods, rather than just it being more like a kind of a family kind of connection. And just as they got used to have to kowtow to those in authority in their community, so similarly, they felt they had to do the same thing with the gods. They had to flatter them. So these ideas of prayer developed. You know, you are the most mighty, the most high, all that, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and just in the same way that they might have to pay taxes to the big chieftain um, o over in the other village. Similarly, they developed ideas of sacrifice to the gods because they must have to develop the same relationship with the gods in that way too. So these ways of making meaning um, actually arose in every one of the great early civilizations around the world. Yeah, Aztec, Maya, Inca, Mesopotamia, Egypt, India, China. And then it was really only about 2,500 years ago or so that two previously unprecedented patterns of meaning arose in two parts of the world that became so important that they've basically shaped the way of thinking of billions, and in fact, the majority of humans on the earth right now to this day. And these happened in Greece and China. And let's take just a few moments to look first at what occurred in China. So there in China, they, the civilization there developed a, really a highly sophisticated version of that initial hunter-gatherer realization of everything being connected. So in China, they saw everything being related dynamically to everything else through these kind of myriad cycles of yin and yang. Some of you may recognize that symbol of yin and yang in the middle there. Um, and they saw that as forming what they uh, call the, the Tao, the way nature manifests in its mysterious ways in the universe. And they developed a book called the I Ching, which basically means the classic, uh, the book of changes. Because to them, it was understanding about the changes was what, um, what it re was really about. And the different uh, schools of thought that developed in China were all about pondering the Tao, basically. Like, how 
could a person harmonize most skillfully with these sort of undulations of how the Tao presented? And as they thought about that, they developed a new pattern of meaning, seeing nature as basically a harmonic web of life. And to get a sense of what, what that means, like imagine, say, like you're in a forest and you come across a spider's web and you, you're looking at it. And you know that just the tiniest little drop of water or just a leaf, just touching that web will cause undulations and throughout the entire web, through the reverberations. So similarly, the Chinese understood the heavens and earth and humanity as resonating with each other, creating this kind of universal web where the slightest movement of one part undulated throughout everything else in the universe. Meanwhile, a very different pattern of meaning arose on the other side of Eurasia in Greece. And this one, um, is known as dualism. And it saw the universe as fundamentally split into two dimensions. And this is a picture uh, of Aristotle and Plato. And the, uh, the older guy there is meant to be Plato. And you can see he's, he's pointing up at the heavens because he was the one who probably did the best job of crystallizing this new way of thinking in ancient Greece of this dualistic um, cosmos of two different dimensions. So he described this transcendent dimension that was totally away from our, our actual world. And this was a place of abstraction, a place of, that was unchanging and perfect, eternal. He called it the dimension of ideas. And this was um, the opposite of the world in which we lived, which was polluted and changeable, and really was just this pale imitation of what was there in this eternal dimension of ideas. So up there in that dimension might be the good, this incredible eternal concept of goodness. Down here there might just be a few things that are good, but never quite reaching that perfection. And humans too were split. So along with that split in the cosmos, he saw the split human of a soul and a body. And the soul was what connected humans to that perfect divinity. The soul was eternal but the soul was imprisoned in this polluted, changeable body, the body that had feelings and it could never be trusted, and the body that died. And in fact, there was this conflict between the two because the idea was the body was really like as the prison of the soul. When the body died, the soul then got to be freed up to join divinity, if you will. And it was in that soul that rational thinking occurred. It was this the house of the pure mind. And... and uh, what they did was essentially lead to a kind of deification of reason. And it was through reason that connected man, as, as they viewed humans, um, with transcendence and eternity. And that was the way of thinking that Christianity inherited. So the early church fathers reinterpreted that kind of Platonist thinking um, in the frame of Christianity. And so, you know how nowadays we tend to just hear about the conflict between Christianity and science. That's one of the ways in which our sort of world is structured right now. But in fact, um, early Christianity served as the incubator for science through this notion of Christian rationalism, which thought that by perceiving the truth through reason, you know, man as they, as they conceived, could arrive at this kind of glimpse of God's mind. And this was actually the vision that inspired the great pioneers of the scientific revolution, like Galileo, Descartes, Newton. In fact, I love to show this image, which is actually the image of um, something that Kepler, one of the great sci scientific pioneers of the 17th century, he drew his, his conception of how the different planets must revolve around the sun. Because he felt that God being this perfect geometer must have developed, must have designed the planets to revolve around the sun in perfect geometry. So he figured that they had to follow these perfect shapes like a sphere, a cube, and a pyramid. And that was the key to the universe. And what's so astonishing is that this way of thinking um, actually has survived and is uh, is, is current in mainstream scientific thought. So for example, <clears throat> Stephen Hawking's bestseller, The Theory of Everything, um, he, he finishes that by saying that if and when humans discover this theory of everything, 
He, he writes, it would be the ultimate triumph of human reason, for then we would know the mind of God. So this amazing, like, powerful sort of thought um, went through this Western tradition. And, you know, we live every day with the wonders that this scientific thinking has brought um, and the technology and everything um, that, we can, that we can be so grateful for, that that way of thinking has led to. But that's only really half the picture. Because along with that sense of a split universe came this idea of a mechanistic, desacralized world. If God is the source of transcendence and sacredness, that means the rest of the world must be really more like a machine. So there was this idea, and um, this is actually a medieval picture depicting God as the great clockmaker, because back then the clocks were the, the ultimate sort of uh, the latest thing in technology. And so it was this sense that um, re really the whole world that we know was this machine that was given specialness by God up above. So when Descartes came up with his idea of cogito ergo sum, I think, therefore I am, his notion was it was that, uh, that reasoning ability that connected humans to divinity and a human's own body and all of the animals around were really nothing other than machines. So that led Descartes, for example, to support vivisection, where they would actually you know, nail up dogs um, and cut them open to look at how their heart worked. And he'd say, oh, even though it might be screaming, it's really no, nothing other than just the sound like a violin chord. It has, it's just a machine, and there's no meaning to it. And that way of thinking, again, has not just survived into the present day, but has formed some of the foundations of present day thinking. So maybe the most successful popularizer of science today, Richard Dawkins, actually writes in his books about how he, he says, life is just bites and bites and bites of digital information. So we've moved from the clock metaphor to the computer metaphor now. And, and actually says that that is a, a basically a machine in another of his books. Um, and along with that concept of nature as a machine came another powerful idea of the conquest of nature. This is Francis Bacon, who was one of the great prophets of the scientific age, who famously said, knowledge itself is power. And back in England, they developed, um, there was the new royal society uh, devoted to studying science. And the first historian of that institution talked about this vision to truly to command the world. And Descartes talked about how we could render ourselves the masters and possessors of nature. And the Europeans, took the same notion of conquering and applied it to the rest of the, human, of the human world too in colonialism and imperialism. So here's like this, um, I, uh, this idealized image of Columbus arising in Hispaniola. And the Europeans felt they had this inborn right to essentially ravage not just nature but the other continents for their benefit. So actually when, when Columbus did arrive in Hispaniola. And he wrote in his journal, he was, which he was going to um, send back to Ferdinand and Isabella, the king and queen of Spain at the time. He wrote about how um, naive and um, loving these indigenous people were, and they give you anything that, um, that you were interested in, as if you were a family. And they were so naive that they would take a, a, a blade and cut themselves because they didn't realize it would cut them. And then he writes, they would make fine servants should your majesties command it, all the inhabitants could be taken away to Spain or made slaves on the island. With 50 men, we could subjugate them all and make them do whatever we want. So that was the kind of frame of thinking that the Europeans brought with them. And of course, his vision there got realized beyond his wildest dreams in the ensuing generations. And with a genocide of um, North and South America that's become part of our history. Like in just one place, Potosi, Bolivia, the site of the greatest silver mine in all the world. It was a mountain of silver. It's estimated that over generations, eight million indigenous people were enslaved and forced to work and died early deaths in this, in this, in this horrendous mine, uh, breathing the poison of mercury, which they used to get the silver out. Eight million people in just one place alone. And we see how this kind of thinking has culminated today in these kind of twin crises we have of environmental degradation and massive global inequality.
So, you know, the exploitation of people that started with this um, ideas of conquering and enslaving the um, Native Americans or um, capturing slaves from Africa and bringing them to work in the, in the New World has led now to this amazing uh, reality that these six men, the six wealthiest men in the world, now own as much wealth as half of the entire world's population. Hard to even get your head around that. Similarly, the exploitation of nature has led to our ransacking the natural world the, um, with fracking and climate breakdown and deforestation. And so what are then these modern cultural patterns that we've inherited from, from this past? Well, <clears throat> I see our global civilizations being on this unsustainable course we're on right now because the meaning we've derived from the world has actually been based on this sense of disconnection. So, you know, maybe this is a, a sort of iconic picture of our age right now, everybody on their iPhones. And, of course, they're, you, they're separated from each other, connected to the technology. And equally, they're separated from their food. When they, when they go to um, get the, uh, the Chick-fil-A or whatever it is, you know, they're not even thinking, even aware of where that food comes from. You just pay money and you get your food um, given to you across the counter. So these core mainstream values are based on separation coming ultimately from those dualistic splits that we've been looking at, going all the way back to the ancient Greeks with those metaphors of nature as something to be conquered and a machine to be engineered. And to get a better sense then of sort of what are the underlying messages we, we get from our mainstream media, from mainstream ways of thinking. Let, let's just look at a kind of image that pretty much all of us are familiar with. You know, like you turn on CNN, you get the, the kind of news. But beyond the top line of what she's saying, let's look at some of the things that she's actually saying to us. She, what she's really saying is we're all separate from each other and the natural world. What she's really saying is we're all naturally selfish and that, in fact, that sort of unbridled capitalism works because some invisible hand ensures that everybody acting selfishly somehow results in the best possible outcome for humanity. She's saying that really nature is a machine that we can engineer and what makes humanity great is to conquer nature. And through technology, everything's possible. In fact, we can even have somehow infinite growth on a finite planet through applying technology. And she's saying, and oh, by the way, everything's meaningless. So fill it with consumerism is the ultimate message that we get from that. Uh, but by continuing to see humans as essentially separate from nature and from each other, we've found ourselves on this unsustainable path of ecological destruction. So the reality of this is terrifying, and yet it's barely mentioned in the mass media today. I'll just give you a few statistics that some of you may be familiar with. Um, we've actually, it's hard to believe, but 60% of all animals around the entire world have been wiped out since 1970. 60% wiped out. We're looking right now at the sixth great extinction of species since life began on Earth. Billions of years ago, there have been five natural mass extinctions. We are now in the middle of humans propagating the sixth great extinction. The coral reefs and the oceans are going to be annihilated this century because of climate breakdown and the increase in, in carbon. And uh, leading scientists at the UN tell us that at the rate of degradation of our topsoil, there's only enough topsoil left to support about 60 more harvests. Perhaps out of all these kind of scary statistics, the one that is most disturbing maybe is this notion of by 2050, there will actually be more plastic in the ocean than fish by weight. Amazing. So where is all this going to lead? Well, there are many scientists and observers, including Paul I like, by the way, that um, Tia mentioned who's here at Stanford, um, who looks at the real serious possibility of collapse of our civilization at this rate. And there's another scenario that I think 
is less talked about, but in a way from a moral point of view, maybe even worse, that we can call maybe like fortress earth, this notion that the affluent minority in the world continue to enjoy their lives, their sort of internet enhanced lives uh, behind the barricades they set up, whether it's the, the wall on the border or whether it's just the barricades of the developed community, while the vast majority of people suffer the devastation of runaway climate change and ecological destruction. But it doesn't have to be this way. There's also a path to a more flourishing future, but it would require a different set of values, values based on a sustainable worldview. So what might that look like? Well, fundamentally, it would be based on a sense of connection rather than separation that has been there in our mainstream Western thinking that's now become global. And even the Western tradition had that kind of sense of connection um, underlying it um, through what, what I call in my book the Western moonlight tradition, because just sort of like moonlight, it gets, um, you can't see it in the bright sun of that dualistic mainstream tradition, but it was there all the way from the early Greeks, Heraclitus and Aristotle, to Leonardo, to people like Spinoza and Goethe, people who were looked at the ultimate connectivity of everything and tried to understand the world in that way. And we see it today in modern systems thinking, things like um, complexity science, network theory, systems biology, chaos theory. And this way of thinking um, in modern sciences of connectivity looks at nature as being a complex system. So this is a different kind of worldview that recognizes our intrinsic interconnectedness with each other. And in this kind of non-linear way, so like the founder of chaos theory, a scientist called Edward Lorenz posed this famous question. And he said, is it possible that the, f the flap of a butterfly's wings in Brazil could lead to a tornado in Texas? because of this nonlinear way in which all of the complex things in the world interact. So that way of looking at connectivity might remind you a little bit of um, that Chinese idea of nature, the harmonic web of life. And in fact, the system's view of the world is filled with a lot of insights that are more connected with that kind of indigenous and traditional worldview. And it sees um, a connected earth. It recognizes our connections with all forms of life, and it sees humanity as being embedded integrally within the natural world. So in place of those root metaphors, things like nature is a machine and conquering nature, it's a different kind of a worldview leads to a different sense of meaning, like um, seeing life as really a web of meaning, and recognizing that in, in this earth, we're all in this together, in the middle of this gigantic universe. So with that kind of background, where I want us to um, lead our thinking right now is how does that relate to this idea of cultural mindfulness? How can we recognize and maybe potentially reshape our own patterns of meaning? Well, one way of thinking about it is to go back <coughs> to how the patterning instinct works. Remember this notion of we look at the stars and every culture like puts constellations out there. So when you begin to create a pattern and put things together like that, what you tend to do is highlight certain things and ignore the things that don't fit within that pattern. That's really what a pattern is. Like another way of looking at it is um, look at these, these kind of squares and you look at it and instantly, of course, you recognize certain patterns. You just instinctively just see patterns there. But that's looking at it through one lens. If you look at it through the le a different lens, this time through color, the same dots suddenly show up different patterns, different ways of thinking about stuff. And what's another uh, thing that's so important is that the actual words we use, the language we use, also helps to form the patterns and shape how we think about things. There's this great study that was actually conducted way back in 1930, where um, people took they, uh, uh, a group of people and they showed them these kind of ambiguous shapes. And they, they divided this group into two, two groups. And the first group, they showed them the shapes and they showed them these words 
in relation to those shapes, right? So the second one down rather than a gun. Then they kind of gave them some cognitive challenges, made them do various things, and then later on, they asked them to remember those ambiguous shapes that they had shown them originally. Well, the people who had been shown those, um, those shapes with words on the left remembered the bottle as a bottle, and they remembered the gun as a gun. The people who had been given those words on the right remembered the same shape as a stirrup or a broom. So there was this great way of looking, of recognizing how the frames in which we look at ambiguous concepts really affects the sense we make out of them. Another way of looking at this is to just take this kind of image of nature, like some sort of lovely jungle picture like this. So we, we could imagine that, you know, thinking about those nomadic hunter-gatherers thousands of years ago, they might have looked at um, a scene like this, and they might have seen it through their frames looking something, something like this, like this world filled with spirits, where human spirits and animal spirits and natural spirits were all interconnected in this transformative way. Whereas right now, maybe somebody who's a, a developer might look at that same scene and say, <laughs> Great, re re really nice place for an eco-tourist resort, right? Or another person, say like an executive of an agribusiness um, transnational corporation might look at that and go, fantastic, palm oil plantation. Um, so the, the way, the frames in which we see things, totally, we can be looking at the same thing but making very different sense out of it. And although, you know, it's easy to laugh kind of thing at that, at that, um, that developer, but the same thing applies here. Like we, we can look around here at, the, um, at this wonderful institution, this, the, this auditorium we're at right now, and this campus. And from um, one particular frame, we can look at it and feel this great and um, wonderful uh, place of higher learning and a place where we can share ideas and people's lives can get launched in this great way. But imagine if you were an, uh, an Ohlone Indian, and so, somebody who, the Ohlone were the tribe who lived on, on this land uh, for thousands and thousands of years, probably more than 10,000 years. And, and then suddenly, uh, out of the blue, these brutal Europeans came and demolished their whole culture, demolished their relationship with the land, and caused this massive genocide. So now there's just a few Ohlone left trying to reclaim uh, their, you know, their own culture, their own language the, um, from this piece of land. Do you think maybe they might look at this land from a different frame and understand it in a different kind of way? So th these are some of the things that cultural mindfulness can help us with. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take you through just a little bit of a, a framework that I've um, kind of developed for myself, how to think about these sort of ambi ambiguous concepts like nature's a good one to kind of explore a little bit. And then I'm, I'll, uh, I'll invite you to just try your own uh, sort of approach, this kind of cultural mindfulness. And, I'll, uh, and so don't, don't worry about it, I'll, I'll lead you through it. So um, you'll, you'll see where I'm going. But let's just think for a minute about like some concept like nature. And think about it in this way of like the stories and, and the metaphors we use and the outcomes. So the kind of mainstream stories about nature, we've talked about a little bit in this presentation. You're all familiar with these, you know, humans should conquer nature. Nature has no intrinsic value. It should be exploited for maximum human benefit. It basically presents an engineering challenge and um, natural resources can be valued and they can be owned and bought and sold. These are the stories we hear every day in the newspaper, on the TV, et cetera. And they come from metaphors such as this core underlying metaphor, nature is a machine. Um, and the outcomes um, from this way of thinking, not necessarily all negative, that way of thinking has led to this scientific revolution that's allowed all the technology that we can be so grateful for. But it also has these potentially very negative outcomes of climate breakdown, environmental degradation, and an unsustainable future. And then there's this alternative kind of metaphor, like what about if we think of nature as a harmonic web? Well, that leads to a different set of stories, right? There can be stories like everything is connected. Humans are part of nature. The Earth, or Gaia, is a, is a holistic living organism. 
And if our society thought about nature in that way, well, that would probably lead to different outcomes, like a, a more sustainable and healthy ecosystem or living within our planetary boundaries. So this is the sort of framework for understanding how uh, we can look at these big, ambiguous concepts that we structure our lives around and see them in very different ways. So this, this kind of practice of cultural mindfulness that we can explore a little bit, you can use it to get a deeper understanding of a theme or a topic. And if you care about trying to affect meaningful change in society, it really helps to look at those deeper questions. Or if you have your own initiative or project or something you're working on, it can help to understand some of the implications and frames behind that, or just for your own inner investigation. And we can apply this to any kinds of things. I sort of took you through a way of thinking about it, of, think, of thinking about nature. But any kind of general amorphous big theme that, uh, uh, that we basically use to structure our patterns of meaning around, this kind of cultural mindfulness and um, mind mapping, I sometimes uh, call it, can be used. So what I'm going to do is invite you to choose a theme that feels kind of alive for you. You can choose, any of, say, any of those themes that you see up there. Or maybe there's one that feels really meaningful to you that I didn't um, capture up there. Or maybe relates to your own initiative or project you're working on. But some overall um, big theme around that. So take a minute and just think about one that comes alive for you. And now, now you've got that, that theme in your mind. Let's actually remember the, the title of our whole week of pause. And let's just give ourselves some pause right now, just uh, for a few breaths. Let's just kind of, um, I invite you to just become a little bit more internal just breathe and allow your own mind to become the center of your attention. So now as you begin to center, um, I invite you to ask yourself, what are the normal stories in our mainstream culture that are generally said about the theme, whichever it is that you chose. The kind of things you hear on TV or read in the newspaper, the story is about that theme that people take for granted. Okay. And now as you think about that, ask yourself, what are some of the implicit assumptions or metaphors that lead to those stories? What are the things that we oftentimes take for granted but don't, haven't really thought about so much but underlying those stories? And what are the, some of the outcomes that we see in our society from those stories about that particular theme? So now, having done that, let's think about what is an alternative foundation of thinking for that theme? So you can ask yourself, if I were an Ohlone, uh, a mem an, an Ohlone person 500 years ago before contact and that theme was being talked about, what would I be thinking about it? Or what would a traditional Chinese person pondering the Tao be thinking about that theme? What would be a different way, a different foundation and what kind of stories would that lead to? What are the things that could be said about that theme that might come from that different way of thinking? 
What kind of outcomes might that lead to? Maybe different than what we see in the mainstream world. So now, having just been reflecting on that yourself, I'm going to ask for everyone, if possible, to get into groups of three, if you can, and just sort of look for somebody behind you or uh, to your side, um, and yeah, pre preferably even somebody, people you don't know. But let's just give, it, and if you're at the very edge, feel free to just stand up and just get a little bit closer to somebody else around you. So let's just find ourselves in groups of three. <clears throat> And as you get together, why don't you just ask yourselves, like ask each person your name, so you, so you get to know who you are, who you're talking to. Okay, so now, now that you're, you're together in, in these groups of three, I'm going to ask one of you to, to choose who's going to go first. And if you're not sure, if you have a hard time saying who's going to go first, let me suggest the person with the longest hair in the group will be the one to go first if, <laughs> if, you, if you can't quite come to the decision. And, and I'm going to ask you to just spend two minutes for that, that person to just reflect, just basically just uh, verbalize to the other two people what came in your mind when you went through that exercise. It could be anything from... I couldn't think of a theme, or it could be like, oh, I, I thought of this story. Whatever feels like most important to you that came into your mind, just share that for two minutes, and then I'll let you know when it's time for the next person to start. Okay, well, so our, our time is up. If, if you want to just bring your sentence to a close, um, and let's all, so if you can hear me clap once, if you can hear me clap twice, if you can hear me clap three times. All right, thank you. Great, well, so, so it seems like there was a lot of, of energetic conversation rising from that. And um, from, from here now until um, I think we're, we're finishing around 8.15 or so, if I'm, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, I'd like to really uh, make this a, a nice open forum to hearing what your thoughts and reflections are and maybe to begin to kick off with, if anyone wants to share what just came out of the, those groups, group discussions, something that seemed really um, insightful to share with, with this whole group. Would, would anybody like to, to share that? Something that came up? It's always hard to be the first person. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, OK. <laughs> the pattern that you're living in and that you can recognize in your choices and in your structure of your day and to step outside of it. But that, that's a courageous mm -hmm. step that yes. brings discomfort as, and also possibilities. So true. Yeah. Thank you for raising that. It is. It's really a lot of courage for ourselves. And, and if we do begin to see things outside of the normal pattern, it takes a whole other than level of courage to actually communicate that with other people who are used to seeing things in their way. And that's, that takes a huge amount of courage just to ask um, simple things. Like when somebody um, just says something that might have a patriarchal quality to it and to say, you know, actually, that's kind of um, uncool to say that. And, and, and you, you'll get those kind of responses like, oh, that person's like, you know, it's really hard to have that courage to break out of those groups. So, so thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Any other? <clears throat> so I don't know if people can hear, but uh, there's a sense that we might be hitting a tipping point at the edge of our resources. And so necessity being the mother of invention, going from uh, you know, conquest, exploration, conquest, domination, into preservation, nurturing from the male energy to the female energy. Thank you. 
But um, also, uh, you know, this terrarium, we just have to adopt. And it's only I don't borrow from you in your book, Albert Einstein, a human being is part of a whole called the bias of the universe, a part limited in time and space. He experiences himself, his thoughts and feelings as something separated from the rest, a kind of optical delusion of his consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circles of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I mean, obviously, we can, one of the greatest insights we can ever you know, have the honor to hear. So th thank you for giving that quote to us. Yeah. And any other, other, other thoughts? Um, I, and I'm also very curious to hear how that exercise worked for anybody. Like, did it help you to see something in a different way? Or did you feel stuck? And, and if, if you did, I'm just as eager to hear that as, as any other insights. But, anyway. If you could go a few slides back to the Hadden Circle, there's a little thing you suggested to think about. I was wondering why you left out love. Oh. Beautiful. And w was love one of the? Um, it was something that came to you in, in when you were doing the that reflection, or? I have a, a similar social values to see if I'm focusing on anything I care about in my life, and mm. that's the first thing I thought when I saw your circle. But it was missing something. Yeah. Well, thank thank you for pointing that out. I love that. That's such a profound a profound idea, and. Um, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a great question because it makes me wonder: Are there, is is love the kind of thing that is um, constrained in these in these like these other themes where different cultures will see it in this fundamentally different way? And I think the answer is yes. Yeah. So There's a movie called The Swedish Theory of Love, where it talks about an act the Swedish government did in the 70s, where they tried to break up love into dependencies and attraction, et cetera, and put the government in spaces to create people, give them individual freedom. So I think it, it really is contextual. Yeah. Thank, uh, thank you for that idea. I, I, I think that that's great. That really helps me to actually break out some of my own uh, sort of sort of barriers, if you will, of when I'm thinking about these different themes. It opens a whole different dimension to the possibilities. So thank you for that. Uh, I think the idea that came to me is uh, in one of the aspects of culture of mindfulness, culture is who you are. Mm -hmm. And that's the self. And there are so many ideas about the self. So if self is in the mm -hmm. image of God or the soul or something, then in that culture the stories are very different. And then the outcomes are also different. The practical things are different. Yes. Yeah. To God and uh, churches and communities will get developed in that way, and so there are different outcomes. Yes. But then, if you, there are other alternative concepts of self, such as in Buddhism, there is as such no self or true self, I think that would be you. And then yes. that would have a different kind of stories that that culture can develop. And then, in mm -hmm. the end, the outcomes are also different, like Greek sources. <laughs> yes. I, th I, think, I think that is so true, and self actually would be an, another one that could do very well to be in that circle. And, you know, self, self is, is so interesting because that is one that I explore in the, the, the book, The Patterning Meaning, to some degree, that in traditional Chinese culture, for example, um, the self is very much something that is community-oriented. People tend to define self as, in terms of relationship. You know, I am a mother or a father, or I am a son or a daughter, or I am part of this community. And everything, the whole notion of self is, is that part of community. And in the West, of course, you know, and part of what led to that Western way of thinking is the self is something sort of indivisible and separate, um, which led to a lot of the, the kind of thinking that we see nowadays in, in libertarian thinking. Um, in, in this country, this idea of the self as being the sacrosanct thing that nothing should be able to uh, sort of constrain what it desires to do. And in fact, a large part of, I think, what is 
part of that alternative connected uh, way um, worldview that's possible is to take that idea of self and actually recognize ourself as being actually uh, the, the very notion of self can be part of our interconnected uh, um, experience with not just with humanity but all of nature. So that whole notion of like I am nature and when you begin to really feel yourself as being part of that natural world in that way then you know you take it personally when you see those, those tar sands ransacking and you take it personally when you realize the coral reefs are getting demolished. This is part of me that's being under attack which changes, rather than feeling like this obligation to get engaged, it's like, well, of course I'm going to get engaged. It's me who's... So, yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. Jeremy, I thought, uh, going back to the exercise and what I yeah. got, got out of it, I, I thought that it was a powerful way to show how having a certain narrative about something can really shape the outcomes and different side effects. Mm -hmm. And furthermore, I think this is kind of a feedback loop. I think, to some extent, the narrative and the outcome also kind of blur it at a certain point. When mm -hmm. the outcome, when, when you have a certain narrative that leads to an outcome, the outcome feeds back into your narrative and your own idea. Yes. Right? So if I think of education, for example, mm -hmm. as I'm working on, um, if, you, if, if the narrative is that school is just a slog and it's a pain, a necessary evil, then that, and it's something to be tolerated for 12 years, or 20 mm. years, then you're going to come out of that experience being a fairly disengaged citizen, right? Mm. Or as Brooke was saying, if, if, if your, your narrative of education is something that, you know what, it's really important to get credential, it's really important that I get my, my O levels or my, or my degree, right? And that's, that's the stuff that matters, I'm not going to worry about anything else, then you're going to have a society where as Brooke pointed out, the only knowledge that matters is what's taught. Yes, exactly. The kinds of knowledge matter less, right? Exactly. And that means, I think that's a feedback. Yeah, and yeah, that feedback loop is so important. Thank you for pointing that out. That's actually a really big part of what we see is how the idea, so if we say nature is a machine and we treat nature as a machine, then that becomes, we actually turn it and we say, oh, and climate change, geoengineering is what is the solution to that. And so thank you for, I know you had a question. So two things, the Chinese philosophy, the web, it's actually the web that has no reason. Yes, exactly, exactly. That's that f f fantastic book by, I'm trying to remember his name, Sprachak or something. And th th there's actually a book called The Web That Has No Weaver. Right, right. Yeah. But, but that, yes. just adding that on there. And just sort of, I'm on a mission to encourage everyone to watch the Netflix film 13th. It's about the 13th mm -hmm. Amendment. And it's like so important for cultural awareness to understand what's happened to uh, the African American population in this country post slavery. Yes. Ha has anybody seen that film here? Yes, so watch it. It's really important. Yeah, thank you for that. And yeah, and I, th I think that just really want to amplify both of those things that you said. That first point about um, the web without a weaver, that's so fundamental to that Chinese way of thinking because there was no God who created the web. It actually self-organized. And that's where many of the modern sciences that look at the self-organization of ecological systems actually share so much with, what, with that core Chinese insight. And I couldn't ag agree with you more that one of the most important ways in which we can look in this country at the cultural frames that need to be understood and re, re, revisited and fundamentally altered is the, really the lack of uh, recognition by the mainstream white population of the amount of devastation that has been done generation after generation from when, when people were first kidnapped and brought as slaves to this country, and how that whole cycle has just been repeating itself again, generation after the next. And that is one of the most important things we can do to be aware of that. So thank you for that. Uh, something in our group that we talked about around prosperity was um, the specific question of, of housing. So like the, the metaphor of housing and, and home ownership in particular mm -hmm. in the United States being a metaphor for prosperity, but also how that shifts with uh, 
uh, time in necessity almost. So I can reject that metaphor of, of home ownership as prosperity, but uh, in the Bay Area, it's really not even on the table for me, right? Like, it's not an option. Right. Right. So it's not as if, I wonder maybe what's your reaction to that is. You know, if, if I'm not willingly giving up that metaphor, it's more I'm being forced into, um, you know, because by, by virtue of the money, I can't participate in that metaphor, whether or not I would want to. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. If we go back to thinking about just mindfulness in itself, Oftentimes we find in our lives that we, we, don't, we may not live a very conscious or mindful life, just things just going along just fine, and then something happens. Like in my case, you know, my world sort of felt like it fell apart, which actually, as I look back on that now, I view that as one of the best things that ever happened in my life because it forced me to look at some of these deeper underpinnings and become more mindful of my own stories and, and learn so many other possibilities. So the same thing could be true in those sort of cultural foundations. We might, we might want to be part of this sort of, quote, American dream and find that we've been shut out of that American dream. Um, but then that can actually be turned into one of the most fruitful things that can happen for us and our society with enough of us uh, actually start saying, this is not working for us. And we need to look at things in a different way around that. So being shut out of a particular myth or culture doesn't have to be a negative. It could, we, through using this kind of cultural mindfulness, we can turn it into a positive in that way. Thank you. Yeah. I have a question. Um, so your list that you had, I noticed you had gender. What did you mean by that? Um, yeah, well... And I can talk about my ways of looking at those uh, mainstream frames or alternative frames. I, I don't know if you had any thoughts that you wanted to just share with the whole group. When I looked at it, um, and we were discussing this whole con the concept of love, I, I'm also thinking there's uh, a bit of an imbalance here, and I'll be talking about the gender roles and the relationships. Right. So, when I looked back up and I saw gender, and I thought, well, initially when I saw that, I thought about you know, the question of gender, which is really on everybody's sort of a you know, list you know, in, in, during this time. But it might have been more helpful. You could put gender there, but also put male and female, or woman, or man, so that people begin to think about men and women. Because I think that something that seems to be missing and why there might be some um, problems existing is because this, her story isn't there. It's missing. And maybe that's yes. an imbalance right now in terms of what's really going on. Okay? Yes. There's, there's no, her story isn't there. She doesn't exist. It's so and, true. And the visuals that you have, you know, great philosophers and people, there was no woman there. Right. Exactly. I, and I, I, th I think that's so true. And one of the things that we see, like as we go th look through this whole historical um, narrative is like with the rise of agriculture that 12,000 years ago, the patriarchy began right then. So, you know, if you look at the ways the, the quote unquote great thinkers, or whatever, the ones who were the males who are able to be heard and got to write down what they wanted to say, where the equally great thinkers who were female might have been heard by a few people around them and would never have had, even had that opportunity. So I think that's, that's absolutely true. And in fact, you know, we can look at this kind of gender frame in so many different ways. Even this gender binary is something we can ask about. And while I agree with a, a gentleman um, earlier, like um, many of us look at this kind of patriarchal way of thinking and talk about how um, we want to move towards a, a more feminine uh, sort of worldview or way of thinking as a, as a positive thing. But even that can lead to this kind of gender binary. They, oh, men are the ones who are hard and young and, you know, and women are the ones who are soft and nurturing. And that can lead to further sort of get ghettoization, if you will, of males and females. And the very notion that there are just two genders and there's not others is one that, of course, is being questioned by many people today. Well, but my real point really is that that is the missing piece. She is his missing piece, and he is her missing piece. And if those two piece, pieces work together, you would have a harmony that you're going to really need. Yes. There wouldn't be this imbalance that, mm -hmm. you know, reaching out, you know, spoiling each other as opposed to one taking advantage of the other. Yes. Beautifully said. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. This is more of a question that, in 
I am not a statistician uh, and my limited experience with statistics, it is not Taoist and that it is hard to find methods to look at data that look at interconnectedness and to find research that is being taught as a, a routine model of how to determine what is so that is looking at interconnectedness. And I'm just interested in your, in your inquiry, mm -hmm. you're aware of any emerging presence of, you know, we live in the era of big data and everyone is singing the praises of how data is going to guide us to the future, mm -hmm. but if that data is all realistic and yeah. not considered in an interconnected way, we're just getting ourselves back into the same place. Yeah, yeah, I see, I, I, I see where you're going on that. And it, it's actually interesting that it's really the rise of big data kind of allows, if you will, the scientification, if you will, of, of, con of thinking about complexity and connectivity. Because in earlier times, you, you, in that picture I had before, some of the earlier people like Leonardo, they didn't have computers to be able to talk about complexity. They could try to like draw the ways in which waves went, et cetera. But now with the, with the ability of computers to look at complexity, I mean, how many of you are aware of um, fractals? And um, yeah, like probably a, a large number. And um, it's really on, only through computing power that, the, um, that you can look at certain, say, equations and look at how they create these amazing fractal patterns. Fra fractals basically are these patterns that replicate themselves at larger and larger scales that we see in everywhere in the natural world. Um, but now we can actually understand them through uh, applied sort of computer um, analysis. And I think that uh, there's, there are these amazing burgeoning sciences, like earth sciences or ecological science, complexity science, network theory, which actually uses the power of computers to recognize that even though something may not be deterministic and um, you may not be able to predict exactly what it's going to do, you can actually get a sense of that, of that connectivity and a sense of the nonlinearity, which also leads to a certain humility, because that way of looking scientifically gets us to realize you can't predict exactly what's going on. Um, we, um, as the one looking, are not separate from what we're looking at. We're all part of this interconnected dynamic, which sometimes leads to a sense of hope about the future too, because once we recognize that, we realize that no matter how gloomy and awful looks, the directions are that we're seeing taking place right now, things do work in this non-linear non way. They're not determined, and it, what each of us does actually has a difference and makes a difference in that kind of, like just like the butterfly wing in Brazil and the tornado in Texas. We never know what action one of us is going to do, which will be that butterfly wing, which will have that kind of impact. So thank you for that. And I'm aware that it's um, a little bit past that 8.15 time. So I think we, we might need to um, call it a close unless, um, yeah, okay. So. Good. Well, th thank you, everyone, for, for being around here today. <clears throat> Thanks. <clears throat> and uh, just a couple of things um, to say. I do have a newsletter sign-up sheet out there. If you want to stay connected with um, basically my articles and things I'm doing, um, feel free to sign up there. Um, and just to, rem to remind everybody, one way in which we all can take part in our future is by making sure we vote before November 6th. So, <laughs> Just make sure you get out there and do that too. <laughs>